are excited to be here and talk to you about Moloch and how we use it to find badness on our network. I'm Elise Rinney, and this is Andy Wick, and we're Paranoids at Verizon Media. We're the main developers of Moloch. It's an open source, full packet capture system. As I said, I'm Elise. Andy hired me in 2016 as a user interface and experience engineer. Uh, I started by rewriting the front end, and since then I've been implementing new features and fixing all the things. Andy was the original Moloch creator. Uh, he's been a paranoid team member since 2012, and his claim to fame is that he was the chief architect of AIM. So I wanted to start off by just diving deep into a scenario. So this started um, when our fire team, our forensics incident response and engineering team, got a CrowdStrike alert. Here's a CrowdStrike alert. We have CrowdStrike installed on all our endpoints. The things to note here are that this local IP reached out to this remote IP, and it ran this shell script. And CrowdStrike alerted that this was a suspicious file. So to start off, um, the analyst wanted to use Moloch. We have all the packets captured so they can see exactly what happened with this file. They're going to start off by searching through the IP uh, for the remote IP for this particular CrowdStrike alert. They're going to search for the remote IP because they want to see what other endpoints reached out to this remote IP and maybe got this bad file. So here on the top, you can see there's a search bar. This search bar indicates um, the search expression. Uh, it has a type ahead. It auto-completes field names operators, and field values. This allows an analyst to create a rich query as quickly and easily as possible. They don't have to remember values. They don't have to remember names and operators. For the purpose of this demo, we've already restricted the time range to the time range uh, indicated within the CrowdStrike alert. So this is great. We only see this one session that reached out to this IP. The analyst wanted to dive further into this issue. They wanted to see um, the source IP sessions. So let's pivot on that source IP. For every field value, there is a list of options. One of these options is to open up a new sessions tab with just this value as the session query. So now we're seeing all the sessions from this IP. We've filtered 317 entries from over 121 billion entries in the database. That's too many to go through, so let's file it down. Let's go through to look at just large sessions, because we know the gopair.far file is a large file. So here we go. We see it, and we have three large sessions, and one of them is the session that we're looking for. So let's dive even further. We're going to open the session and view metadata and packets. So on the far left side, you're going to see a little green plus button. That plus button opens up session metadata and packets. They're sectioned out, so there's the general section of metadata, followed by an HTTP section. And then if you scroll down further, you're going to see the reassembled packets. The analysts look through all of these packets, and they found this little area. There's some weird stuff going on. There's hex encoding before and after that Globa text. So they downloaded this file, they did some forensics, and they reached out to the pair team. The pair team acknowledged them in this tweet, saying, in fact, that was a bad download of that file. The fire team wanted to investigate even further. To do that, um, they wanted to find the last good gopair.far download. They used the little drop-down menu for the field again, they added that URI to the search expression query. They removed that source IP to find any IP that reached out and got that gopair.far download. And then they expanded the time range to a week. So now we can see we've got two sessions that got that download. Let's open up that new one and see if this is a good download or not. Again, it has the metadata that we saw before and below you'll see the packets. If you search through these packets, you'll see, indeed, this is what we expect. This is the good download. And this is the last good download that we could verify 
for this file on our network. They reached out to the pair team again and were acknowledged in this tweet so that other users and other analysts could narrow down their search for a specific time range to find this bad download. And now that you've seen a comprehensive example about how our forensics team investigated this CrowdStrike alert and this incident, Andy's gonna tell you more about what Moloch actually is. Thanks, Elise. So hopefully you just got a flavor of what Moloch can do. And like we say, Moloch is our open source full packet capture system. And we stress that a lot, that it's open source, meaning you can't just always click a button and it instantly works. If you're gonna deploy it, you probably will need someone on your team that understands working with open source software, which we think is a good thing. And we're focused on full packet capture. So we're not trying to replace other tools in your toolbox, we're trying to augment them. We're gonna add full packet capture to what you already have. So what is Moloch? Well, Moloch is based on several open source technologies, especially Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch provides all of our, our database and searching. It's where we store the metadata. And then packets are stored locally to disk in standard PCAP format, which means you can actually use any tool that you already have in your toolbox to read in the PCAP format and work, it, work with it how you want. It's up to you, since it's open source, to determine how long you want to store the data. So you can store PCAP for weeks, months, even years. And the same goes for metadata. You can choose how long to store that, and it can be the same length of time or even longer than the PCAP itself. We created it to uh, replace a full packet capture system that we were using in 2012. I'm gonna go over that. So a lot of people ask about the Moloch history, like where did it come from? So back in 2011, it was kind of clear that AIM was, let's just say, winding down. And so I was looking around at AOL, what else I could work on. I had worked with the security team a lot in the past because, hey, AIM and AOL was a favorite of the script kitties. There may be some of you out there that, you know, that was one of the things you used to do, script kitty type stuff on AIM or AOL. And so I had worked with the security team a lot before, and so I reached out to the manager of that team, who is now actually our CISO, and asked him if there was any opportunities. They were pretty lean at the time, but he was like, yeah, we need a developer. We don't really have any right now. And so I joined the team. One of the first things that I, I heard when I joined the team was about this full packet capture system that they had, a commercial system where it was some, like they were paying $2,000 or $3,000 per terabyte, and it was really slow, and they could only monitor one network. And hey, Andy, can you create something that we could use everywhere? So that was kind of our pre-open source version of Moloch. It just had the basics. Its whole point was to be fast. We were able to deploy it everywhere, not just on one network, and it was great. Then with the support of my manager, he was like, hey, let's open source this. Let's get this out there. And so that's when we really got involved. I started working on Moloch almost full time. And in 2012, we open sourced Moloch, the end of 2012. And the community seemed to really enjoy it and use it. So that lasted through the O.X years, where we switched to Slack from IRC. We built up a community. We supported Elasticsearch 1 and 2. All the features were pretty much open source driven. We used GitHub for everything. It was pretty much the basics. Then Elise joined the team, and the first thing she did is said, this UI is terrible, which it was. You know, I'm the first to admit, I would love to put a screenshot up here what it used to look like, but I, I will not. It was bad. And so she rewrote it. It looks really, really awesome, actually. And of course, the first, one of the first features she added was theming, because you've got to have dark theme, right? Everybody was sick of the, the blue and white that I had done. Lately, we've been working on making Moloch faster. So we rewrote it yet again, the UI part. We're now using the view technology. One of the most recent features we've added was packet hunts. And we're gonna have a demo of that later. We've kept up with Elasticsearch, which keeps releasing new versions. So we now support Elasticsearch 5 and 6. And really, we're just trying to work with the community, adding the features that we want and everybody else wants. So how do we deploy Moloch at Verizon Media? Well, our main focus is between our networks and the scary internet, right? And what the scary internet is really is, you know, it's different with, depending on who you talk to. You might have offices that are talking to the internet or have data centers that are talking to each other, data centers that are talking to um, offices, et cetera, et cetera. And so 
we're very loose on what we mean by the internet, but if someone asks us, do you want to watch this traffic, most of the times we'll just say yes. Like, if you're offering, we'll watch it. And so how do we do that? Well, we deploy NPBs, network packet brokers. We are huge fans of network packet brokers. No matter what full packet capture system you choose to use, we cannot recommend them enough. And what a network packet broker is going to do is load balance your traffic across multiple tools. And it really provides a DMZ of safe area between your network team and your security team. I don't know about your organizations, but sometimes the network team and security team don't get along as well as they could. An NPB can uh, really reduce the number of disagreements about how to do things. As long as you have enough free ports on your NPB, the security team can add as many tools as they want, and the network team can add as many new links as they want, and they don't really have to have lockstep. Uh, deployments. So just, uh, like, if you're deploying some kind of full packet capture system, we can't recommend it enough. We store all of our PCAP on machines that have around 200 terabytes or more of disk space. Right now, machine prices with, and disk prices are going down faster than actual unencrypted net network usage we find. So it's actually easier now, easier now than ever to store more and more data for cheaper. We try and capture almost everything. There's exceptions to that. For example, TLS sessions, we may only capture the first 20 or so packets because we're really only interested in the handshake. After that, it's pretty much useless. And then there may be policy things that you don't capture, such as consumer email or other things. And then how do we use all this data? Well, obviously, we can use it for hunting and incident review. But also, sometimes the network team or applications will come to us and say, hey, do you have anything that can help us with this particular problem we're having? So it can be used for more than just your security team. It can be used for almost the whole company. So I'll just go through two quick, simple uh, sample deployments. Here's an office deployment, what it might look like. So you have, in a typical office, you probably have an HA pair of firewalls that's talking to the internet. You may or may not have some TLS decryption devices. All of those are probably going to have a span port to your NPB. And then your NPB is going to forward the traffic, load balance the traffic, to your visibility boxes. We like to call them the visibility boxes instead of the Moloch boxes because we actually run all of our network monitoring tools on these boxes. So for example, you might run Sericata, Zeek, um, NetFlow, whatever, all in the same box. And they actually complement each other because Moloch is going to be using the disk mostly, where Sericata is going to be using the CPU. You're also going to probably have a centralized Elasticsearch cluster for the metadata for Moloch for all your offices. So, for example, we have over 40 offices around the world for Verizon Media that are forwarding the traffic, their metadata traffic, to a central Elasticsearch cluster. The actual PCAP is stored locally on those visibility boxes. So that's not leaving those offices, but the metadata is. A data center deployment is a little bit more complicated. You usually have two network rooms or, or comm rooms that are physically separated from each other. And instead of span ports, you're probably going to use optical taps for all your traffic. And where you actually have those optical tracks will you know, vary greatly. In this example here, we're pretending it's between our core routers and the wave gear that we're tapping. Those are going to forward the traffic to your NPBs. Because of those two separate rooms, we usually suggest you use uh, daisy-chained NPBs. So NPB2 in COM room 2 is going to forward the traffic to NPB1 in COM room 1. And that's actually going to forward the traffic to the visibility boxes. This is really important with most uh, network security tools, because you want to make sure all the packets for the same session end up on the same visibility box. And if you have any kind of asynchronous routing or whatever with your two comm rooms, the packets could end up anywhere. So that's why the daisy chaining is especially important. The other big difference from the office deployment is you're usually going to use an Elasticsearch cluster for Moloch that's local to that data center, because there's probably enough traffic that you don't want to be sending it across the internet or somewhere else. So, so far in the demo, what we've talked about has been reactionary hunting, where you get an alert or something like that and you use Moloch. You can also use Moloch pro proactive hunting, where someone, like one of your analysts, has free time, or maybe this part of their job, where it's their hunting day of the week, where they can go into Moloch and look for things. So one of my favorite things to do is look for clear text passwords. You can do that a couple different ways. One of the ways is you can just look for you know, basic auth. We, Make it easy to find basic auth headers in HTTP. You can see where they're going. Is it some traffic that's leaving the office going somewhere else that they shouldn't be? Is it something important? Is it something in your data center? Well, it's using clear text. Kind of scary. And then Moloch itself will also look for 
some common keywords for clear text auth and tag sessions, so you can look for that way too. If you're really familiar with your protocols in your network, you can use Moloch to look for any odd protocols that you're not expecting. Like, hey, we're not expecting any MySQL in this uh, network segment. Why is there MySQL here? What is going on? That's another thing to do. There's lots of um, uh, fields having to do with SSL certificates. So you can look at the certificates, see if it's a let's, if less in, let's encrypt that you're not expecting, if there's other kinds of things with certificates that you're not expecting. And then we have some Sericata integration that you can go through. Next, Elise is going to give a demo of our new packet hunting. So packet hunting is a lot different than the previous example I showed. Because in the previous example I showed, we were looking at known metadata for sessions. We were looking at IPs and large sessions and URIs that we knew existed within our sessions. Packet hunting is for when you want to search your network proactively for things within the packets themselves. So in this next example, I'm going to show you how our analysts might create a hunt job in order to search for other bad go pair.far downloads on our network within a specific time range. So they're going to start by narrowing down their search. We don't want to start with 5 billion sessions to search. That'll take forever. We want to search for just .far downloads. Seven sessions is a lot more easier to search through. So let's create our packet search job by naming it. We're going to search through all the packets for each session. We're going to search through the reassembled packets for that hex code that followed the globus hex string in the known bad go pair.far download. Once you create the hunt job, it's going to start running if there's no other in the queue. It's going to run pretty fast because we only have seven sessions we're searching through. That's why it's important to narrow down those results. Once it's done, it's going to jump down to the hunt job history where you can view more information. And look, we've got three matches. So there were three bad downloads of that gopair.far file. If you click the little plus button on the left, you can view more information about this hunt, when it was run, when it was last updated, uh, what the query expression was, and the time range it was run against. You can rerun a hunt job at any time with different search criteria or with a different time range. And you can also remove a hunt job anytime when you're done uh, investigating the hunt job results. So let's open up a new tab with the sessions that just matched our hunt job. So here are our three sessions. Uh, the first session is the session that we already identified was the bad download of the gopair.far file. And the two others were downloaded by our analysts to further investigate the file and determine that it was indeed a bad download of that gopair.far file. We think this is an awesome new feature to add to an analyst toolkit, and we're looking for contributions and some response from the community to see how they use it. And now that you've seen another example about how analysts can use Moloch, uh, this is just one of many features. And Andy is going to talk about Moloch and sustained collection next. So you could use Moloch for more than just live packet capture. You can use it to read in PCAP that you might have already. So what we like to do, and we set up a separate Moloch cluster, and we call it our investigative cluster, where we can use it to read in historical PCAP, which might be past incidences. It might be just things on the web that we're interested at looking at. Or it could be whatever you want. And we use Moloch to deal with that kind of uh, packet capture. It's a separate cluster, so we control how long it stores the data separately from all our live clusters. So we can basically store the session data on here almost forever. You can have tighter access control, so maybe only your IR team has access, as opposed to the live clusters that maybe you know, your SOC and other teams have access. Because you, you might want to be able to have sensitive data on there. The other thing you can do is you can set up your live clusters so they either automatically or with a click forward traffic directly to this investigative cluster. And so we can do this if there's something that we're interested, uh, that's interested in that's going on right now that may or may not be bad. We can forward it over there just so we make sure we keep it for either forever or for until we're done with it. 
One of the recent features that we've added is Moloch and Sericata integration. So Moloch now has the ability to read in the Sericata alerts files, the JSON version of it, and add fields to sessions in Moloch. So as the data is going by, as the packets go by in Moloch, it will look at the log files and see if it matches up with any Sericata traffic, and it will create first class fields in that session. So this example here is in that spy, um, I'm sorry, in that session data that Elise opened up, this would be another section that would show up, and it would say Sericata on it, and here's all the fields for a particular session. In this example, you know, it was potentially bad traffic on port 443. And all these fields are clickable. You can easily add them to your search expression. You can do other things with them. All the things that MOLA can do, it can do with these fields. MOLA can also enrich your session data from, either, from third party systems, either commercial or free. So in this example here, we have an integration with ThreatStream where as the packets go by, the sessions are looked up in ThreatStream, and any data that's found in ThreatStream gets tagged into the session in Moloch. This particular view that you're looking at here is our, what we call our spy view display, where it's displaying all the fields and the unique values for those fields and the counts. So for example, if you look here, there's the malware type from Sandbox with seven. So that means there are seven instances of the from sandbox in this search query result. And so you can see all the unique values. And this is another way to do hunting, where you can say, hey, for this field, show me all the unique values. And if there's something there that I'm not expecting, this is a great place to go. You would pivot on that and go look into it more. You can also enrich your Moloch sessions with just local data that you have. So for example, if you have an IPAM database, you can tag all the sessions with the information from your IPAM database. In this example, there's the security zone and the data center that that IP address is in is tagged into the session. And those, again, are first class fields. You can click on any of these. And this, again, is the spy view display. And so it has the, all the unique values for each field and the counts. So we have an awesome open source community. One of the most exciting things, or as exciting now at least, is that people are having Moloch meetups without us. At first, I was a little sad. I was like, what? People are having Moloch meetups and we weren't invited? But then I was like, wow, that's actually quite awesome to know that people love Moloch enough that they're having their own meetups and didn't invite us. And so it went from being sad to being happy. I think that's a, like, a way to know that your project is thriving if someone actually cares enough to do it on their own. We have a very active Slack community. I would love for folks who use Moloch to please join. Join us on Slack. You know, we answer questions on there. We talk about the bugs, features requests. I mean, we're, we're very active on there. So uh, please do come on and join us. And then we have a very active uh, user base. We have folks from financial industri industry on there actually submitting code fixes. Same with communication companies besides just Verizon. We have the folks who have taken Phil's class you know, they, they are learning about Moloch. That was another thing that was very exciting is when we discovered that um, he had a, a small unit on that. That was awesome. And so we have more and more people contributing or looking for folks in various companies to join us. You know, please, if you have any interest in development, we'd love to talk to folks. And then we get plenty of um, feature requests from non-developers. And we're happy with that, too. One of, the, one of the best compliments that we get a lot is that our support is better than many commercial systems. So, so future work. We have four main areas of, of focus right now. Visualizations. This is one that's dear to me, because right now the only visual, visualization we have is a force directed graph in F3, what we like to call the jiggle graph. Some people call it the Death Star graph. But we need more visualization, so we're actually going to a class soon to help us get some ideas, and we'd love to get community feedback if you have ideas about how to visualize packets or this kind of data. We'd love to talk to you. More protocol decoding. It's never ending. Everybody always wants more protocols to be decoded. Right now, there's a special interest in decoding more network protocols, such as BGP. We're not quite sure how that fits in to Moloch yet, but we're working on it. Cloud support. Super important. We have basic VXLAN, but with 
the new AWS announcement, you know, we need to make sure that we're there, that we're clickable. From the AWS, you could use Moloch directly. In short term, we have Moloch 2.0 coming out in August. Its main focus has been Elasticsearch 7. You know, Elasticsearch is on a constant march to upgrade their version, and we, we try and keep up with them because they're the main, the, the main backing of Moloch for all our search. And we have a bunch of miscellaneous improvements and fixes there. It's going to be in 2.0. So in summary, we think that Moloch is amazing, and we hope you think so too. Full packet capture is very important, and we think Moloch can solve that need. But even if you don't use Moloch, please investigate if full packet capture is right for you, because it's a very useful and important tool in your toolbox. Moloch has the ability to easily integrate external feeds, to enrich your data, to add new fields with no problem. And with open source full packet capture, you can take control of your destiny. You know, you can determine how much traffic you want to store, for how long, where. You, you know, you don't have to deal with uh, some limitation that's set by someone else. Thank you very much. We have a homepage, molo.ch, and on there is a demo. If you've never played with Moloch before, you know, please go try it out. It's a, it's a micro instance, so probably not everybody try it at once, but <laughs> You know, go try it sometime when you have free time. And then we're going to have our third annual MoloCon, October 1st in Sunnyvale, if you're interested in spending a day talking about Moloch with folks like us, folks from the industry. We talk about what we're currently doing, what's upcoming. People present how they use Moloch from the industry. And we would love to have you join us. Thank you very much. All right, big round of applause.